Welcome to today's Connected Caroline show. I have with me Peggy Cooney, who is the author of a book called This Side of Alcohol, which chronicles what she calls breaking up with alcohol in her journey. Welcome to the show, Peggy. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. So Peggy, most people uh, have their journals and or diaries under lock and key. What prompted, prompted you to share your experience of uh, quitting alcohol that first year with the world? That's a great question. Um, because at least the first six months that I was journaling, I had it all arranged with a best friend. Um, if something happened to me, she knew where the journal was and she could destroy it. And then at about a year, you know, I was like, maybe after hearing so many other people's stories that mine didn't seem so scary. And I just felt like as I got away from being a, a, a person that lied because of addiction to a person of truth, um, part of that was honestly, is that I started posting about day 96 in a Sober Sis um, Facebook page. And I just got a lot of response. So, you know, the after, you know, people were following me and they were saying, you, you, should, you should write a book. And I thought, wow, you know, maybe I should do that because that power of that happened to me too um, is, is just so powerful in, in recovery. So, yeah. Most definitely. Um, you know, there are a lot of what is called, are called quit lit books, quit, mm -hmm. quit drinking literature, shortened. And why do you think your posts in the sober cis community struck a chord with with her community what about your writing and your experiences do you think um you know really rang true for a lot of those people yeah i mean i i just think that i posted daily for at least the first year so the first 365 posts were were on a daily basis number one i just think people just got to know my personality by posting every day so I was developing relationships with, you know, with my followers and, um, you know, I, I, I come from a social work background and I wrote a lot of reports. So I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a decent writer. I would say I'm more of a, like a reporter than, you know, than a, um, a memoirist, even though mine, mine's kind of in the middle of being a memoir and a, and a self-help book, um, because I am a social worker, um, and I really believe in systems. So yeah, I'm not, you know, other than that, I'm not really sure about how I could answer it other than um, it was that constant back and forth, you know, the, the, the relationship with the people that were reading it that created that for me. Relationships are a big part of recovery, as you noted. Um, by launching your book, This Side of Alcohol, how have those relationships plus other relationships grown and and, and uh, flourished? Well, yeah, I, I, I'm really lucky that um, one of my colleagues, um, my ex-colleagues who decided to go um, uh, rogue because she has two little boys, <laughs> um, wanted to do um, business coaching and social media. So we really did spend an, uh, a year before the book came out to, do, you know, to really um, develop a, a a relationship with with our readers so that they already knew me when my book came out and I think that that was uh that was a big plus it took a lot for me to do that because up until the point I stopped drinking I think I erased every picture of me that I ever had if it was some you know someone would take a picture for me I'd go behind it and delete it and you know to to where I was changing clothes outside in the middle of uh, Sacramento, you know, for, <laughs> for a photo shoot. So, um, you know, with just having Caitlin, you know, hold up her sweatshirt for me to change. And I was not convinced in the beginning that, you know, that I would splash my face all over social media. It was, it's kind of an antithesis of who I am, kind of a, more of a under, under the bridge kind of person, but, you know, she's right. They got to know me because they read my words and they saw who I was. So, yeah, most definitely. By the way, you have an excellent media kit. 
for social work for somebody who doesn't come from a marketing background i was very impressed with your your Thank materials you. definitely um so when did you come up with the title this side of alcohol i i don't remember um there's such a contrast between before and after for me mm -hmm. and and again, I'm, you know, I'm a late drinker. I didn't drink until I was in my fifties. So, I mean, I have a problem that I drank, you know, I drank, but um, it just, it just came, a lot of things are coming to me and I'm about the least woo woo person on the planet. In fact, my friends tease me about it, but there are certain things, even when I was writing, I would think, oh my gosh, I don't know what to write today. And I would, it would come to me or I would have an idea about what I wanted to write and I would have a voice that said no you don't save that for later you need to write this today and I'm starting to become a believer in in um how the universe is sort of guiding me and I can't believe I'm saying that publicly because I'm not that kind of person but you know I'm writing an essay piece on my mother right now and um the ending, the last sentence to the essay just came to me. So I had the last S, you know, the last sentence and I'm working backwards because it, it just came to me and mm -hmm. it's, I'm still not quite there. Um, but, you know, again, um, I, from the time that I stopped drinking and I was on my knees in a Lake Tahoe cabin and I heard this voice very clearly saying, Peggy, you're done and you're going to be okay. And I started letting things in after that, but that was, that was clear as day. And I'm really, you know, I, I know you're not asking this question, but I feel so grateful because after that, I have not had a desire to pick up. I had a thousand day ones before I had nine months. I had four months. I had, I had times where I said I quit drinking. I was totally lying about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I haven't had what a lot of other people have is that struggle. I was done. I was completely done. So perhaps that's because you did get tangled up with disordered drinking later on in life. So I want to touch on that because I think that's an important nuance to your story mm -hmm. is that, and I think that's a very common thing um, in women that they're ramp up the drinking, maybe after like empty nester type thing. What was your situation what, that accelerated your drinking? I'm a social worker. I was in direct practice. And um, by that by my 50s, I was probably about, I don't know, 15, 16 years then. I knew that becoming a social worker, I knew there would be child abuse. What I didn't really understand what was going to happen is system trauma, which again, you know, a, a child discloses their abuse and they go live with strangers. And that broke my heart. It broke my heart. And I, um, no matter what, kids want to be with their parents. And it is, it, it's just one of the most screwed up systems ever. But I, I'm a teacher now, so I, I have a, the ability to work on it and make it better. You know, Maya Angelou says we do something until we learn better and then we do better. And, and we are a really young field and we're just learning what's, what's working and what doesn't work. And then um, I became a whistleblower, um, willingly. Mm -hmm. And the agency I worked for really kind of made my life hell for a couple of years after that. And, and then there, there's like five, I would say five things. Um, I'm a blended, I'm part of a blended family. So I'm a stepmother. And when the kids were little, everything was fine. When everyone became adults, it got more complicated. And I'm not sure why. I'm still really uh, looking into that. And then one thing that I didn't realize until maybe maybe a year ago was menopause. Mm. And I it, it never clicked for me until I started hearing someone else's stories about the insomnia 
the insane insomnia people were having because I didn't have any physical symptoms. I didn't have hot flashes. I didn't have anything. So in my brain was telling me, oh, you, you, uh, you dodged a bullet with menopause, <laughs> but I never really associated, um, the not sleeping part. And I spent thousands of dollars on sleep studies because I couldn't sleep. So, uh, you know, I had that same, uh, really belief that alcohol, you know, having a couple of glasses of wine would put me to sleep and it did until three o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. but I didn't really associate that till last year. Yeah. Uh, that is a big factor for women of a certain age is menopause. And the problem is I'll just note this right now and then we can move on is that until like just lately, no one's talking about menopause and every single mm -hmm. person. I remember asking a friend of mine who is about 25 years older than I am to help me with menopause. She's a healer and a social worker. And I, and she's like, it's just fucked up. No, there's no two women that have the same thing. So it's impossible no. to like diagnose exactly it, but there are uh, people like Dr. Annika Becca out there that's really helping women control uh, that, or take control of their situation, whatever their symptoms are uh, through nutrition and health, you know, and um, it's, it's finally getting talked about. But when she had asked me, what did your mother tell you about menopause? I'm like, nothing, because she thought she didn't have it. Now that I know much, much more, and also the tie mm -hmm. into out to like alcohol addiction and drinking and disordered drinking at that time period. Um, you know, my mom, I'm like, oh, hey, mom, what about like when you got depressed, you know, for that, like five years? That's, that was her menopause. It was just depression. Weight gain, she thought was just normal. That's just what happens when you're, you know, late 50s, early 60s, mm -hmm. or she had a late menopause. So anyway, I, I'll, I'll wrap it up there. But it's really a big issue for women. Um, the, the tie between drinking and, and menopause is, is real. Um, yeah, and at that time, physicians were clueless. I mean, mo at least mine was, and you know, they just prescribed uh, Ambien, and uh, right, that was exactly. that was its own little nightmare, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. God, thank God. That's anyway. On an, that's a whole another subject. Um, so, <laughs> so, sorry. So, no, no. I love. I actually love all the little sidebars that happen during my interviews. So back to your book, The Side of Alcohol. Um, you have a community now, a very vibrant com community. You are what I would consider an influencer in the Quitlet uh, world. Uh, you have events that you produce. And why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because I think your North Star is pretty clear. Um, you know, is is combining your social, it's, it's, you know, everything you've done to date, it, it, feeds into what you're doing now. Why don't you talk more about that? Yeah, I mean, I do I do quite a few things right now. Um, I have the, it's an interactive Facebook page. So um, there's a certain, you know, I do a, a post, account post on Mondays, Tuesday, we highlight somebody in the community that does, um, is out there, we call it uh, this side of alcohol, uh, TSOA or is doing life AF. So, um, and so we have, we highlight uh, community members doing being social and uh, without alcohol. And Wednesdays, I, I do a raw journal entry, no edits. And uh, so I'm like maybe at three day 365 right now or something like that. And on Thursdays, we do a discussion question. And it's so interesting because this last Thursday we did, you know, what did you give up? Uh, what did you give up when you stopped drinking? And it was it's so interesting. I'm sure you know this is that you think, oh, that's a lame question. And then it was like the, the most answered question I had. Um, and so I kind of want to plan to do so. And then on Fridays, we do a community quote. So it may be a Maya Angelou, it might be Tupac, it might be somebody that said something really cool on my Facebook page. Then I do a weekly newsletter. I also um, run a local group. So we um, Zoom on Tuesday, so the San Francisco, Northern California Bay Area. So then we, we do activities like a couple weeks ago, we went to uh, Becky Bulmer's uh, 
yoga class. And then uh, last week we went to Ocean Beach Cafe, which is a, a non-alcoholic uh, uh, restaurant and bottle shop and got to do some wine tasting in a speakeasy room. Josh is a, a big influencer and, um, and was the mixologist at Sober in the City in Sacramento. I'm also working with Susie Streelman on Sober in the City, which is a social event that we have. We had it in Long Beach in January, um, Sacramento in May, and uh, on November 11th, we'll be doing it in Austin. It gets bigger every time. So within that, we have a bunch of activities that we do for the whole entire weekend. I'm also a host for Ola Sober, um, which um, Susan Christina from Madrid um, uh, started that about two years ago. And, um, and so I, I host uh, a weekly Zoom meeting and also write for Ola Silver Magazine. So I'm pretty busy. Yeah. <laughs> but, and you're right, my North Star is, and I just finished my audio book will be out next week too. So I'm really excited about that because people are, have been asking for an audio book. And that experience itself was so cathartic, reading my own, my own words. And with, again, people that came into my life um, that I would have never imagined would have done my audiobook, um, one audiobooks. But again, you can sort of tell that my North Star is paying it forward. And so I just, I just love, you know, working and, and also do on present, you know, I did a presentation. Let me go back a little bit. My university, I work for UC Davis and they are, I'm so lucky. Part of this openness about my sobriety is that they encouraged me to live my sobriety out loud. So I was allowed to present my book in terms of uh, secondary trauma, vicarious trauma for first responders in Anaheim in June. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we're developing some curriculum because we don't talk about it. We, d we don't talk about where first responders have stress and it, it doesn't go anywhere. So it ends up in relationship issues, eating disorders, prescription, spending, sex, or what happened to me was alcohol. Oh my God. Lots <laughs> going on, Peggy. And you're teaching. Like you oh were, yeah, and then I, there's that. There's that. <laughs> there's your day job. <laughs> That's my day job, yeah. But your passion for paying it forward in this uh, community is very evident. And, Thank you. you know, I know that so many people get so much out of your, your This Side of Alcohol Facebook group um, and have gotten so much out of your book and your events. I mean, you're really taking it to the next level in a really positive, wonderful way. Do you have another book in you, Peggy? I don't know. Um... You know, I feel like I'm, I'm having so much fun and writing for the Ola Sober magazine. Um, I, I love doing that. I kind of love the interview reporting style. So I'm not really sure. Um, next month, I'm going to interview an 11 year old girl who asked her mom to stop drinking. And she wants to be interviewed. So I'm going to put her in the magazine. Her mom, her mom wants to, um, she and her mom are totally behind this and I'm so excited that I get to put a kid's voice in this. Mm. So huge. I mean that is another thing that really isn't um talked about and or is is done so much behind closed doors and that's the family systems part of it and just the yeah. mom kid part of it and it looks different for every household. You know, yours are with stepchildren, mine are with my kids. Uh you know, my my and different ages completely but there it, it would be it, it there would be a whole magazine that you could dedicate to the yeah. kids of um, any kind of addiction or problem or you know thing that is divisive within the family you know and um, you know one of the things that uh, the group the luckiest club talks about uh, their number one sort of nine things is it's not your fault. And I think that's an important thing for people to understand that especially alcohol is marketed like in every single crack of our world, everywhere from onesies for little kids to, yeah. you know, 
celebrities peddling alcohol to, to all kinds of stuff. And I mean, it's everywhere. And only because the sober, curious, sober community, alcohol-free community, however you want to call it, it's getting so big. Are those ginormous companies, which you know, are are creating alcohol-free options, which is a good thing. Yeah. You know, um, how do you feel about all that? Oh yeah, it's definitely. Um, I I here I'm going to recommend Ann Delsett Johnson's book Drink because she wrote it nine years ago and it's way ahead of its time and uh, really talking about alcogenic society on how women and actually men, this happening to men too, but the, you know, big alcohol is really targeted uh, young girls. They're starting to target young boys. I mean, all I have to do, I just got back from the grocery store and there's a whole complete um, uh, display of uh, what Ann calls Alcopops, which is the right. sweet fuzzy drinks that are all directed at 13 year old girls. Right, right. Um, and they're starting to do it with boys too. And uh, one's called uh, Daddy's House or something that's targeted to boys. And so, you know, they've taken the playbook right from uh, from tobacco. From tobacco, yes. That was, in right Holly's, that was in Holly's book, right? She like really outlined it. Holly Whitaker's. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. She That book was great in terms of education on the evolution of addicting people. <laughs> Or, or, or yeah. marketing to people a lot with addictive substances, starting with tobacco, going into alcohol. Uh, yeah, that's how. And what's so started. serious about the alcohol part is that you know, story after story that I hear from people is that they were, they were sexually assaulted when they were when they were drinking, mm. and you know, so that's another dimension. It's not but men are starting to get assaulted as well. You know, predators kind of waiting for somebody to get drop dead drunk and then assaulting them. And so many stories from women are around that, you know, and having so much shame around that. So it's hard to talk about the fact that, that, you know, you, you were drinking and you were sexually assaulted and how do you know, how do you, how do you deal with that? And you deal with it because you get on a zoom call and there's so many other people that just went through the same thing. Right. That's how you deal with it. And that's maybe wrapping up, you know, back to the word community, because there are so many communities out there. There are not, there's not just one way to stop drinking. Mm -hmm. There's many, many, many ways and many, way, many uh, philosophies around it. So if you're turned off by one, go search out another. There's a ton of them. We, sober sis, I did sober sis as well. Um, the month after you, you did it a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's why, that's where I discovered you was on oh, those wow. posts. And um, I love, you know, I love that. Yeah, I yeah. love it. My mom, my mom didn't have that chance, right? My mom, you know, my mom had some alcohol issues and, uh, you know, all, the only thing that was available for my mom at that time might've been AA and I don't discount AA. I mean, uh, there, there are things that, that AA offers to people, but, you know, um, at the time, you know, my mom, would have never gone to an AA meeting. And now there's modern recovery is exactly what you say, that it's your own smorgasbord of how you want to, how you want to um, stop drinking. And, um, and then the science, my mom would have loved the science behind mm -hmm. all of it. And that's what really um, always does it for me, any kind of brain science, any kind of, of science, even, even around trauma. And, um, you know, and what alcohol does to the brain and all of that is it, once you know that you can't unknow it. And so that, those are, you know, some foundation pieces that keep you from picking up the next time. I know Susan Christina went through some, uh, from Olaf Sober went through some really difficult, um, and she's still going through some difficult cardiovascular surgeries. She wouldn't be alive if she didn't stop drinking four years ago. Mm. hands down and then yeah, of course the science the science I agree with you that really was I love the fact that that there there are quit lit books that are science first and that really do get you between the eyes you, you just it, you know this is what happens your body you know just the word homeostasis right like oh yeah I remember learning about homeostasis yeah. and <laughs> 
physiology. But, you know, and that really, comes, <laughs> and that's one of the things I recommend all the time because my husband just, he, you know, he had no, he had no clue. And, you know, all of us, I think were there at one time. He's like, you just need to stop drinking. What's wrong with you? You exactly. just need to stop. It's your fault. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that was my point is that there, there's so much that goes into it. It isn't your fault, but as they say in Laura McCowan's, uh, the luckiest club, um, the author of we are the luckiest book that, um, uh, it's your responsibility. So yeah. it's your responsibility to fight, figure out what flavor works for you. If you really want to stop and guess what, if you can really want to stop and then, you know, you start again and then you start all over again, you know, it's like, it's not a one and done for like a lot, a lot, a lot of people. So the whole shame and, you know, that whole piece is really sort of an outdated concept should be. I hope it is. I hope it's getting there where, you know, people do feel empowered. Oh, it's a revolution. It's a revolution. It's a revolution. It's, you know, in California, it's, there's a term called California sober <laughs> where uh, you just don't drink everything else is you know possibility if you want to but it that's that's like a, a term I hear all the time are you California sober meaning do you do <laughs> edibles <laughs> that's really what they mean um anyway so Peggy Cooney thank you so much uh yeah. for sharing about your book the site of alcohol um and and writing your book it, thank you, you you know it's a gift to the world most definitely and it's a gift to women in midlife um who are recognizing that oh my god you know i'm, I'm drinking a bottle of wine every night or two or whatever or i'm drinking because i'm stressed and i'm always drinking because i'm always stressed and and one of the things you learn when you learn the science is that it makes you stressed and have anxiety it doesn't help it it helps it for 20 minutes and then it's just doing its job to make it all worse so get some education. I think that's like key. Get into a community. That's key. You know, it can be anything, but something that really feeds your soul. And Johan already says it. I mean, it's the best 18, 18 minute tech TED talk with Johan Hari says, you know, the opposite of addiction is connection. And it's yeah. absolutely true. Totally agree. And in, in any way, if you're a shopper, gambler, sex addict, whatever it's all the same, you know, connect with people that have that, that you can talk this stuff out with that really helps. So just like we're doing right now, Peggy, anyway, <laughs> thank you so much with that laundry list of things that you outlined earlier. I, I know that you've got to jump and you've got so much going on and thank you for taking the time out to be on this podcast. Thanks so much. And uh, all of Peggy's contact information and all the um, books and communities that we discuss will be in the, in the notes section. Um, so that's a wrap. And until next time, this is Caroline with the Connected Caroline Show. Make it a giving day. Thanks, Peggy.